I hate when I have to come on here and talk about another wrestling personality that we have lost, especially when they're young, but it's even worse when they take their own life. We saw it with Ashley Massaro two years ago. We saw it with Hana Kimura last year. And that was the awful situation that unfolded Wednesday night with the death of Shannon Spruill, better known to wrestling fans as Daphne, the Scream Queen from her days in WCW and later on in TNA. She was only 46 years old. She went live on her Instagram with a very disturbing video Friday night, clearly in a state of distress. I was getting ready to go live on YouTube as soon as Dynamite ended when I saw what was going on, which is why I was checking for updates during the stream to see if she was okay, because it was pretty scary stuff. She was crying, talking about not wanting to be a burden on her friends, talking about how alone she felt. She said the thing with CTE and concussions is that it can only really be diagnosed after you're dead. So I don't want to do anything to hurt my brain. I want it to be studied. I want the future generations to know don't do stupid shit like me. Remember, my brain goes to Boston, straight to Boston. Boston being where the Concussion Legacy Foundation is based, which was founded by Chris Nowinski, Harvard Chris from Tough Enough, who got signed to WWE and then suffered a very severe concussion early in his career that really ended his wrestling career before it even got started. And in the video, she was holding what appeared to be a pistol. Immediately, friends of hers from all across the wrestling business, including Mick Foley, were on social media pleading for anyone who knew her home address to let him know and let the authorities know. He said he tried calling her phone number, but it went straight to voicemail. Police went to her home to conduct a welfare check and met her mother there uh, per TMZ. They knocked on the door. There was no answer, so they left without trying to get inside. They came back a second time hours later. This time they got a key to the apartment from the maintenance man, but it did not unlock the deadbolt. So they called the fire department and they broke the door down and they found her with a gunshot wound to the chest. As she said in her video, she did not want to do anything to uh, harm her brain because she wanted it to be studied for uh, concussion research and for CTE. In WCW, she played David Flair's deranged girlfriend she managed him in Crowbar, Devon Storm. She even had a short run with the Cruiserweight title. She was cut by WCW a month before the company was sold to WWE. She did later get signed by WWE to a developmental deal, but she was released later that same year. In 2008, she signed with TNA. And on commentary, they would sometimes refer to her. I don't know if it was a Taz thing or somebody started referring to her as being zombie hot. She even has a t-shirt up in her pro wrestling tea store that says zombie hot, which is a great way to describe her. She had this girl next door vibe to her. If the girl next door had multicolored hair and tattoos all over her body. The following year is when she got hurt the first time really badly on a bump that she took from abyss during his Monsters Ball match with Mick Foley at Bound for Glory, she climbed up on the rope. She got choke slammed down through a barbed wire board on the floor. She suffered a broken arm, horrible concussion. In a blog post, Mick Foley said she was never really the same after that match, and I am so sorry that I was part of something that expedited the end of her in-ring days, and which also may have exacerbated the mental health issues in which she struggled until her death. Daphne struggled with mental health issues quite a bit. She took medication twice a day for a chemical imbalance that she talked about in an interview that she did with High Spots. She suffered from bipolar disorder. She suffered from severe post-concussion syndrome. 
Now, I should say that we don't know the exact reason that she ended her life. It may have been a combination of things, but her talking in that Instagram video about CTE and about sending her brain to Boston tells me that she still, after all these years, was suffering from the effects of not only that concussion in TNA, but other ones that she suffered during her time working there as well. In 2010, she suffered a third concussion and a stinger in a match against a student of the Team 3D Academy, which is run by the Dudley Boys, called Rosie Lotta Love, which I think was a spoof on Rosie O'Donnell, if I remember. This woman had to be every bit of 250 pounds, maybe more. And she was totally reckless. She sat down right on top of Daphne. She just crushed this poor girl. And then she hit a sit-out powerbomb on her, which is probably where the concussion happened. That was this woman's tryout match. And they signed her anyway. And three months later, she was gone. And years later, she dropped 130 pounds and signed a developmental deal with WWE, and they put her in the Mae Young Classic. And she didn't last long there either. But Daphne really took a beating working for that company. And a year after her TNA run ended, she was in a terrible auto accident where her car hydroplaned and flipped over upside down in three feet of water. She escaped, thankfully. She, if she wasn't wearing her seatbelt, she thought that she probably wouldn't have survived. Four years ago, she had neck fusion surgery because she was dealing with pain that was so bad, even with pain meds, she couldn't sleep. She couldn't think straight. Now, a lot of you may remember my rant about the way that TNA treated Daphne and, and really their overall poor treatment of their female performers back on Sound Off episode 156. That was in April of 2011. I talked a lot about Daphne and what happened to her. Terry Taylor promising that they would cover her hospital bills after the Bound for Glory bump and then later reneging on that promise, basically saying, you're an independent contractor, it's not our responsibility. And then when she filed a workman's compensation claim against the company, they let her contract expire. Daphne's issue with TNA was not one of greed. And in some interviews I've seen her do over the years, she, she's brought this up, and I think it's an important point to make because some people would hear this story and think that she just wanted to you know, sue them and get as much money as she possibly could out of them. Her story was not one of greed. When she was in WWE, she got hurt. When she was in OVW, she suffered, I think it was a dislocated kneecap. It was some kind of knee issue. And WWE took care of it. They got her a brace. They took care of her medical bills because the injury happened on their watch. Even though she wasn't on the main roster... She wasn't on Raw, she wasn't on SmackDown. It happened on their watch, and so they took care of it, as they should. In TNA, it seemed like if you were a big name, you probably would be okay. You probably would have your bills and stuff taken care of. You know, I doubt very seriously that if Sting got hurt in a TNA ring, Dixie Carter would have been like, tough luck, Steve, you're on your own. For someone in, in Daphne's position, to TNA, she didn't seem to be much of a priority. What she did, she could have filed a personal injury lawsuit against them for damages. But she chose not to. She chose to file a workman's comp claim. Because what she was trying to do wasn't just to collect damages for herself and, and pay her bills, which were mounting at the time, but... To clarify, once and for all, definitively, in a court of law, that wrestlers are not independent contractors, they are employees. The company they work for controls so many different aspects of their life that they should be entitled to the same benefits as any employee would be. Remember the Jesse Sorensen injury. When he was paralyzed, briefly, thankfully he recovered from that, but it was a very serious injury. He could have lost his life. That was when Zima Ion, who is now Joaquin Wilde on the NXT brand, he came off the top rope out on the floor with a moonsault and landed right on Sorensen's head, right in the wrong spot, and almost crippled the guy. 
Remember his story and what Dixie Carter promised him and his mother and that whole fiasco, which I also covered at the time. Daphne tried to convince uh, Jesse Sorensen to join in her suit with her, but he didn't do it. Yeah, maybe he was worried about being blackballed the way that she would have been. Yeah, you, you can kind of understand that, right? He was still young to the business at that time. Didn't want to close any doors that might be available to him in the future. So he didn't join in with her. He chose not to. The deadline that he would have had to have filed by, it expired. And then I think it was three or four months later, TNA let him go. You'll have a job for life, they told him. And they let him go. Right before the judge was about to make a ruling on the validity of TNA classifying its workers as independent contractors, and after the court had just ruled that Daphne's attorney could depose Dixie Carter, they reached a confidential settlement with Daphne. Surprise, surprise. Had they lost that claim, they and WWE stood to lose millions of dollars by having to change the way they classified their talent. It would have changed the entire wrestling business. It would have changed the entire landscape. If TNA didn't act when they did, I think Vince McMahon would have, even though he wouldn't have been able to pick Daphne out of a lineup, and none of this had anything to do with WWE. I'm sure they would have intervened, because the last thing they would have wanted was TNA's incompetence to cost them millions of dollars. But it never got to that point. They reached a settlement. And Daphne really wasn't allowed to say much about it after that. But what happened to her is a tragedy. It really is. And the fact that she felt like she was all alone. Nobody should ever feel that way. Especially not someone who received the kind of outpouring of love that she received on social media from people who knew her. People who worked with her. Who she helped along the way. And befriended. They would have dropped everything they were doing to try to help this woman. A lot of them did try on Wednesday. That's part of what made this even sadder. Just, you know, seeing and hearing about the video and everything that was happening was bad enough. But then you see all these people who cared so much about her scrambling in in just desperation. Posting on Facebook and Twitter. Please, does anybody have her address? Does anybody have her number? Please, get in touch. I can't get her on the phone and just feeling completely helpless. By the time they got to her, it was too late. But I wanted to share one story of a very nice thing that Daphne did. And I think it says a lot about who she was and her character. And I don't mean her wrestling character. I mean her character as a human being. It's a story Mick Foley talked about. As did Michael Bukikio. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He's the owner of HighSpots.com, who was very close with Daphne, very friendly with her. Daphne was very good friends, once upon a time, with a woman named Vicky Lyons. Forensic Files, a television show. I know some of you might be aware of it. You might even be a fan of the show. Forensic Files did an entire episode about Vicky many years ago. When she was four years old, She was run over by a Ford pickup truck that backed up over her while she was playing outside. She survived, but she was left disabled. She had permanent damage to her skull and one of her eyes. Uh, They said that she would never be able to lead a normal life. She died 10 years ago of a brain aneurysm in her sleep. I think she was in her mid-30s. But before that, she had taken an interest in becoming a pro wrestler. She had already bucked the odds. I think she had gone to school and everything, and she was trying to lead a normal life. And she wanted to wrestle. She took an interest in it, and she went to wrestling school. And she trained to be a wrestler for five years. And she befriended Daphne during that time. This was before, I think, Daphne even landed in TNA. And Daphne spent hours upon hours with this woman so that she could live her dream of having an actual wrestling match. The one and only match that she ever had in 2008 was against Daphne, who of course put her over. That match is on YouTube and knowing the story behind it and then watching it is a very cool thing to see and a very cool thing that Daphne did for her. 
That's the kind of person that she was. It's a very sad end for someone who deserved much better. And I will second what a lot of her colleagues have been saying the past few days. If you are someone who is having dark thoughts, suicide is never the answer. You don't get a second chance. You don't get to hit the undo button and go back and do it over again. You can talk to someone. Reach out to some. Reach out to a friend. Reach out to a family member. It doesn't even have to be someone you know. But in this country, you can call the Suicide Prevention Hotline. There is a phone number that you can pick up, and everybody has a phone. Today, everybody has a phone in their pocket. And it's a free number to call. 1-800-273-8255. There's always someone that you can speak with. And believe me, it is always better than the alternative. Nobody should ever feel like they're trapped and only have that available left to them as an option. There's always someone there willing to give you an ear to talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. They may not be able to help, but sometimes, you know, you look at this situation here feeling like, I I don't have any friends, I don't have anybody to talk to. You do. You may not think you do, but you do. Now, after Daphne's death... WWE sent out a mass text message to the entire roster reminding them that if they're dealing with a difficult personal matter and would like to speak with someone, and in the message they provided the name of a counseling company with a phone number, they said you can contact them or you can contact WWE Medical. And I thought that was a a very good thing for them to do, and I would hope that other companies would do the same with their talent as well. They would follow WWE's Example here and do something similar. One person who did not think much of the gesture was Carl Anderson of the Good Brothers, who wins said tweet honors for this week. When Sean Ross Sapp tweeted about WWE sending that text message to its talent, if they're in need of help, Anderson tweeted back and has since deleted, saying, They suck, bro. Despite deleting it, he went on a Twitter spree. He was replying to people with all kinds of just childish nonsense. Maybe it was in his mind he was being in character. Maybe he wasn't. I mean, that's an easy excuse for a lot of these, you know, idiots who post shit on social media to hide behind. Oh, I'm just just being my character. I'm in character. I'm being a heel. No, you're being an asshole. I would say that he was drunk tweeting, but I don't want to blame the alcohol. He could very well just be that much of an ass. He's calling everybody marks and gloating about how AEW kicked NXT's ass on Wednesday nights. But that's not even the point. This all started because the man couldn't read the room. Even if you are cynical as to their motives, and you have every right to be. And he worked for the company. So he may have personal examples to share of situations where he felt WWE was not there for him or for the other talent, or that they caused certain situations that cause a lot of anxiety for people. It's very possible. I mean, there's also this congressional testimony from Vince McMahon admitting that the only reason WWE started offering free drug rehab for any of their wrestlers that have ever worked for the company was two words, public relations. That is an actual statement from the chairman of the board. So it's not like we don't already know this stuff. People have every right to question their motives when it comes to stuff like this. You know what, though? It's still a great thing for them to offer, and it has helped a lot of people. But there is a time and a place to have a discussion about it. The fact is, mental illness, it is a serious problem. Depression, it's a very real thing. A lot of people go through varying levels of it. And if Daphne's story brings it to the forefront, even just for a little while, it's good on WWE's part to remind its talent that, hey, don't forget, we have these services available to you if you should need them. Get in touch. Maybe it saves a life. You never know. 
WWE, they didn't issue a press release about this. They didn't put it on their social media. They blasted it out to the talent, some of whom leaked it to the writers. That's how we found out about this. But a person just died. And Carl Anderson decides, you know what, now would be a great time to go on Twitter and make an ass out of himself and just go after WWE. He obviously realized it was a bad look or else he wouldn't have deleted the initial tweet. But then he chose to go and make this about WWE. And go after the fans online. And all of a sudden, all the nice messages that I was seeing from different people talking about Daphne, it turned into R.I.P. Daphne trending on Twitter to Carl Anderson trending on Twitter. And then once I saw why, I, I just sat here and shook my head and said, what the fuck? It's a good thing his first name ends with an L. Makes it easier to hand it over to him. Carl Anderson, your sad tweet winner for this week.